Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, a show where we talk to experts who've taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have sailed around the world to those who've started thriving businesses and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. This is episode 14 with adventure, writer, and all-around badass, Caroline Paul. This episode was brought to you by Prana. Prana makes clothing for all kinds of adventures, from yoga to climbing, surfing, after surf, even work. We pretty much wear Prana product every day. Best of all, they're built to move with your body. So for surfing, swimsuits stay on, which is awesome. Shorts flex even when you're reaching your legs in weird climbing spots and in yoga. And dresses are constructed to go from the beach to a meeting or a date, which is great for me because I don't love changing. You can wake up, get dressed, and hit the road. Also, for those who care, Prana keeps the environment in mind when they make all their products. You can check out Prana's sustainability video series at prana.com. And right now, if you go to the website and enter the code WILDIDEAS, you'll get 20% off full-priced items. Today's guest is really smart. She's also very thoughtful when it comes to talking about adventure and cultivating bravery. Caroline Paul is the author of four books, including the New York Times bestseller, Gutsy Girl. As a kid, she did a lot of wild things like trying to set a Guinness record by crawling. She even attempted the luge to try to get into the Olympics. She went to Stanford to study communications and became one of the first female firefighters in San Francisco and then a writer. She has very strong opinions about fear and bravery. I really enjoyed this show. I hope you do too. All right. So Caroline Paul, welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. We're super excited to have you on. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. So you had a lot of wild ideas. (laughs) As a teen, I think you tried to set a Guinness record by crawling eight and a half miles, which is super impressive because running eight and a half miles is painful on a track. You built a boat of milk cartons as a kid and had your twin sis and a friend join you. It broke on a rapid, the first one, but it's pretty awesome still that you did that. You went to Stanford to study communications, thinking, I'm, I'm just maybe putting words into your mouth, you're going to become a documentary film filmmaker. Then you became one of the first female firefighters in San Francisco, and now you're a writer with a couple of kick-ass books, including the bestseller, Gutsy Girl. So you are just the perfect guest for this show. Super excited to have you on. I want to talk to you about this wild idea of, of becoming a writer and specifically kind of an adventure writer. Um, first, I, I guess I just want to ask you, why did you become a writer? What was it about writing that kind of pulled you in? Well, uh, I will say that I don't know if it, my, my wilder idea was that I didn't want to be behind a desk. Oh, yes. And I knew that from a from a really young age, like I loved being outside and I was sort of horrified by this idea of a briefcase and a desk. And yet that was sort of what I was preened for. I, I uh, went to prep school. I went to Stanford. I was sort of supposed to carry a briefcase like all my friends were doing after I graduated. And, you know, I had this um, sense that if I did something actually at the time I thought being a journalist or a documentary filmmaker would be a way to have adventures, you know, go out and be on the front lines of a war or hanging off a cliff. Like, um, you know, like, uh, at the time it was, uh, David, uh, Bershears who I had a huge admiration for. And now it's like Jimmy Chin, these people who are, you know, they're marrying their outdoor skills with a practical, career. And I thought, okay, I'd love to do that. And um, so at the time, really early on, uh, you know, I think it was like a lot of people in second grade, my teacher said, wow, you're a pretty good writer. And, you know, honestly, I wasn't, but I held on to that idea. And as I was growing up, I could see that there was, you know, some, some really amazing ways. I was reading National Geographic, um, and I could see that there was a way perhaps to 
have adventures, avoid a desk, and um, you know have some sort of real career. And it kind of worked out. I mean, the the truth is, I I didn't think that writing was an option for me. I didn't know any writers who wrote books when I was growing up, uh, but I thought that documentary filmmaking again, and I think it was really Dave Brashears. Uh, heard about him and his climbs on Everest. Ironically, it turns out a friend of mine married him. So it was wow, funny and ironic funny. that our lives are that small. I know. So I thought, well, boy, okay, I'll be a documentary filmmaker. And, and I was actually in grad school for film when I became a San Francisco firefighter. Interesting. So it's, do you want to, can you just tell that story um, for those people who don't know and have read your book? Can you just talk about how you became a firefighter? And I, then I want to go back to writing if possible. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, it was, it's a, it is an odd way and people get super sad about this because it's really, it's a very coveted job and it should be. Um, and I sort of fell into it. I was not one of those people who grew up wanting to be a firefighter. It wasn't an option for me. I mean, even in my small rural town in Connecticut, all the volunteer firefighters were men. They were like my science teacher and the janitor at the school and, you know, the local butcher. They weren't the men, the, the women, I think one woman drove an ambulance and I think somebody else was like on the phone. I don't know if that's technically dispatch. <laughs> we were, this was, this was a long time ago, but there weren't, so there weren't role models for that. And, uh, so, you know, I'm saying that as sort of an apology to all, all the listeners, listeners out there who have just dreamed of being a firefighter. Cause it's an amazing job. I actually was working as a news reporter for a radio station up here in Berkeley. Again, I wanted to be uh, sort of a documentary person, a journalist slash. I was doing a bunch of things. I was interning with a documentary filmmaker, but I was also sort of trying out my chops in radio because that was I was learning to report. And uh, so uh, at the about at about this time, there was all these stories coming across the wire about the San Francisco Fire Department and how racist and sexist it was. And this was 1987, a long time ago. And uh, so, and then I heard that there was a test coming up, an entrance exam. And I thought, wow, why don't I take this entrance, entrance exam uh, and get an undercover story on the racism and sexism in the San Francisco Fire Department? So I went and took the test. And of course, there was no overt racism and sexism towards me because I think as most of us know that's really not I mean the reason these um, things are so insidious is that they're way more subtle than that you can't just pop into an institution for a day and be like oh I see exactly where your where your problems are and so I took the test went through the process and uh, and to my shock I got in so, uh, that's a good story. Then, you know, it's a lo- it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it changed my life. I was so lucky. I was, you know, it was my, I was 26. I was pretty lost. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I had, um, I had friends who had, you know, done the, the, the career trajectory. They'd immediately gone to grad school. They'd immediately gone to law school. They'd immediately become, you know, gone to Oracle or, or uh, Apple, whoever was hiring at that time. And I, I didn't, I wanted to have this adventurous life. And all of a sudden, I think, you know, maybe because it was always in the back of my mind to have an adventurous life and you make all these small decisions that lead you there, even though you don't know it, I suddenly became a firefighter, which was the most adventurous life you could have. What did you learn, I guess, most about humanity from being a firefighter? Wow, that is a big question, Shelby. How about about yourself? That is a big question. Sorry, it's probably longer than That's for also one hour. a big question. No, no. What, I mean, what are I'll, some I'll, of the I'll things that, I won't bore people. that stick out? I mean, I've heard you on other podcasts talk about this, and, and you've talked about kind of ha- what you think of death now after after being a firefighter. What you, I, I think one of the things that stuck out is in another interview I listened to, 
you said you learned how fast life can change. I think there was a guy who locked himself out of his house and he, I, I mean, you'd have to tell this story better than I can, but he climbed up a few stories higher than he should have and fell. Actually, I mean, the sort of, I think what was so shocking about that instance and why it sticks out, I mean, because I've seen so much death and destruction. I, I work worked here in San Francisco for almost 14 years, and I was on uh, at the busiest station for 10 of those. As soon as I could pick a station, I picked this station seven, which was, and then the busiest, the rig that went to the most fires in the city. So I saw a lot, but sometimes you know, the, the big fire isn't the thing that sticks with you because we went to a lot of big fires. This instance that you're mentioning, it was a guy who'd actually just climbed his fence. It wasn't oh. even 12 feet. And that was what was so Jeez. sad about it. If you're going to climb three stories and you fall, which I've also seen, um, then it's sort of not a big surprise. But I think you're rocked back on your heels when you're like, oh, I could have done that. I could have just, you know, tried to scale my teeny fence and then fell wrong right on your head and died. Mm, That's so, So I I mean, people say life is short, but um, (laughs) uh, I think as a firefighter, you, you see that a lot. One thing we, we didn't even talk about. So before you even became a firefighter, you were kind of on this quest to just either get in the Olympics or, or do something great with sport. And you chose a sport that was um, a winter sport. <laughs> Can you just talk a little bit about, about this, uh, this little experience and adventure? And it's, it's a fast sport and probably one of the most scary sports that I would never do. Yeah. <laughs> I hope your listeners don't think I'm a little bit off my rocker. No, now all my, I've, all my I've guests are off their record. rocker though. Come <laughs> okay, on. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. You know, um, I really, when I, since being, since I was a kid, I watched the Olympics and I thought it was just this amazing event, bringing all these people from, you know, different countries. At the time it was amateur and uh, there was something just so courageous and everybody seemed to have such integrity and I, and I wanted to be an Olympian, but I wasn't good at anything. And uh, that's sort of the story of my life uh, that I'm not, I'm a jack of all trades. I'm not superb. I'm not, uh, you know, I wasn't born skilled. I am dogged. Uh, I am usually very fit. Uh, and I, uh, yeah. And I have, uh, I think I, I set a goal and into setting a goal. So I wanted to be an Olympian and I, um, decided that since I had no talents, the best way to become an Olympian was to pick a sport where there weren't very many people. <laughs> So I picked the sport of luge and um, luge for those of you who might not know is uh, the sport where you get on something essentially sort of a cafeteria tray and you slide down an ice chute feet first. Uh, And so, yeah, at the time this was 1985. Wow. I'm cringing. uh, It just sounds so sketchy. I mean, how fast do you go down a luge? Um, well, you know, the top people go 90, oh. um, I, you know, I, as I say in my book, the gutsy girl, uh, I was terrible at it. I mean, I was a terrible loser. I crashed all the time and people would come when they heard me <laughs> at the starting line, they would come to, they'd cluster around this turn that all, that was a turn I could never quite make when I was really going fast. And they, they wanted to watch the acrobatics that happened. And the one thing that made me, I guess, a, an okay loser was that I was persistent. Like it didn't, whenever I crashed, it didn't really phase me. I just was like, oh, I got to do that again. And I, I did um, go to the hospital once. But otherwise, um, yeah, I just just uh, just kept dragging my sled up the hill and getting back on it and, and going down. It was kind of a good sport for me in some ways. How far did you make it with Luge? Well, I actually was invited to the national team. Um, awesome. And uh, yeah, I mean, and, I, and uh, it was it was it was a long and bruising road. Uh, but it was actually when I say long, it wasn't actually that long. It was about a, it was a year. 
But at the time, like I said, I mean, the people that did luge were simply the kids that grew up in Lake Placid, where the only track in the country was at the time. Now they have another one in Colorado. I think they have one in, they might have one in Michigan. But now luges, I mean, I actually know, I've run into people who are like, oh, no, I was a luger. (laughs) There's another firefighter uh, in this country who is a uh, silver medal Olympian. Uh, mm. Leanne Parsley, she's amazing. And um, uh, so I think now people have heard of it, but back then nobody, nobody had, and that was good for me. Cause there was, you know, there was only uh, uh, 12 women sliding at the time in the whole country. Wow. And yeah, during the tryouts, and I talk about this in my book, I, um, crashed like I always did. I'd, I'd only been uh, losing for a little while, but I wanted to uh, enter the nationals anyway, because then I would be nationally ranked. <laughs> and in fact, I was, I was uh, last, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I still being last is being at the time. It was actually somebody dropped out. So I was actually the 11th best loser in the country that is so <laughs> awesome i have the lowest championship record for pole vaulting and i think the history of pole vaulting not as cool as national champ but um I was no like, that's cool did you actually even fly in the air i, I mean, I've did tried pole vaulting and i was like I, what i cleared opening height and that's all i could do we had no coaching it was the first year they had goal, girls pole vaulting and they're like shelby's a goalie and she'll do anything um, I was a goalkeeper for soccer, um, but I can't jump or crap and I, I'm not very coordinated and I don't know. I just, I was the only girl who would do it. So I cleared opening height. And then when we got to the <laughs> championships, I could barely clear opening height. That's it. And people were really shocked and a little horrified um, that I even made it that far. But anyways, this is about you. Um, yeah, you've had so many great experiences, Caroline. And I love, I love the book Gutsy Girl. You know, on the jacket or in one of the press kits, it's it's described as the lean in for middle school girls. But this is a book for men. It's a book for women. It's a book for people of all ages. How did the idea to write Gutsy Girl come about? Well, in in um, purely practical terms, someone heard me read a story about one of my misadventures and she was a mom and she came up to me and she said, you know, you should write a book about your adventure for girls because they really need to hear them. And, and that really re- actually resonated with me mm. because I had been thinking for a long time about how women really hold themselves back yeah. and how it starts really young as a, as a girl and how oh, so many of the messages that we get um, are to be fearful and not courageous Whereas I think a lot of the messages and I know a lot of the messages that boys get is to be brave and courageous. And I saw that in the firehouse. I mean, the men I worked with were so brave and they took it so seriously, that value. And um, I had grown up as an adventurer. So I understood that value inherently, too, because I'd seen it in my male friends and I thought it was important. But in general, outside the firehouse, I didn't see a lot of women that valued that, that valued being brave and pushing, getting outside their comfort zone. And, um, and so I, and I, and I think that, that being brave brings with it so many great life lessons that it seemed like there needed to be a book to encourage girls at an early age, that this was a value um, that they should embrace. And then it was a feminine value because I think that we really do, you know, equate men with bravery uh, and, and, and women with fear. And I'm not just saying men that do this, women do this too. We expect ourselves to be fearful and you'll n- notice it Shelby. I think that a lot of probably the, a lot of the women you hang out are pretty kick-ass I'm sure, but I'm sure you are also run into women who say they're scared a lot. Yeah. I mean, about things that are not scary. Yeah. People are scared of the water and not more women than men. I mean, I teach all women to surf, but just cold water, gray water, water. That's not crystal clear blue. It's scary. You know, it's, it's so cool yeah, that you they wrote also, this, go ahead. 
Well, I was just going to say that I think that men are scared too, but they understand that that doesn't have to be the primary emotion. Mm. That they, you know, so when I mean, I've seen men be scared. <laughs> um, I've seen men. Um, I can tell when someone is nervous when they feel outside their depth. But in general, what men do and what, what I admire a lot and what I want women to learn is that they uh, realize that they can, they sort of assess themselves and the circumstances and they do it anyway. Now, I know that men can be very reckless and that that's an issue and that's not an issue I deal with. Um, but I do think that there is obviously something called rec- recklessness. But women have a lot to learn from, from men about you know, facing being that scared and then realizing that that's okay because there's a ton of other things going on too. Like it, you're also excited and, um, you know, invigorated and you're curious and you're going to learn something great. I mean, there's so many other aspects to a fearful experience. And I think men simply prioritize these other feelings. You know, I've had a lot of guests recently talk about fear and how to conquer fear. Um, I just had on Jamal Yogis, who's an author in Ocean Beach, and he wrote The Fear Project. He talks about, you know, how he conquered fear through mindfulness, and there's some science stuff that he did as well. But how can we, as women and as men, you know, cultivate bravery? Is it recognizing these other emotions besides fear and putting them forward? And I don't know, maybe you could illustrate this with an example, like, like the time you walked across the the giant bridge in San Francisco or one of your other amazing escapades. Yeah, the um that is actually that that is a chapter in the book I I use in the Gutsy Girl to illustrate how um you know, fear is an emotion that we have and I'm not against fear. Uh I'm actually uh, you know, I do know that it's something that we need to pay attention to because it's a it's a it's a warning signal about what's going on, but it's not the only warning signal. And the interesting thing about fear, and as a firefighter, this is what's happened to me. I, I had a situation where I was with my crew and we were crawling down a hallway. And for those of you who haven't been in a fire, and there's probably most of you hopefully haven't, um, unless you're a firefighter, it's pitch black. You don't see anything. And it's often very, very hot. And so we were crawling and it was a strange fire. And we, I kind of knew something was strange, but, you know, we're just four of us crawling down a hallway and all of a sudden there was a huge explosion. And we were blown out of the hallway. And it was one of the few times when I'd actually really felt scared. Not when it happened, but when I was back in the garage, sort of putting my mask back on. And there was this moment of hesitation that I'd really never had before about going back in there. But in fact, and people laugh at me when I say that, but my fear was actually misplaced because that situation had been scary. We had, we had been in what's called a flashover. We hadn't actually been in it, but it had been close by. If we had been in it, we would have been dead, (laughs) but it was close by. And that's a scary situation. But when I was in the garage, the situation was actually over. It was done. So my feet, it was actually safer in there now because whatever had, you know, made the flashover happen, that, that, that concentration of gases was now over. It had exploded. So now the place was almost safer. And yet I was, you know, felt this amazing, this sort of paralytic fear, which I was not proud of um, and man- and did overcome, but startled me because it was so deep. And of course, you know, I'd almost died. But I also, I use that example to show, well, not only that you can act after fear, but also the fear, it was actually, um, it's a little, fear lags, it either lags a little behind or it's often a little bit way too much ahead. So fear itself is something I think that when we use it as a, as a sign, uh, we have to really be careful because often it, it, the timing isn't right. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking about all the times I was scared and I didn't react to it until after the fact, or I overreacted before it happened and my fear was completely misplaced and what I was about to do was easy, not something to be feared. So I think everybody relates to that. That's really, I've never heard it been put like that. So I really like that. And then, you, you know, you talk about, 
when I was talking to you, you're like, I just want to surround myself. You know, you don't, you don't, you're not really that into things. It sounds like more, you're more into experiences and you talk about which I love is surrounding yourself by other kick-ass people. So you can do kick-ass things. I, I would love for you to talk about that because I think you illustrate that really well when you're like, I just had these badass friends who wanted to climb the golden. It was the golden gate bridge, right? Yeah, yeah. Who wanted to go up and which is yeah, illegal, I, but so don't try this at home. But, um, you know, I have kick, I want to surround myself with kick ass friends who do kick ass things. Like instead of going to a party, your friends were like, hey, let's just go climb the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. I mean, I, yes, I, my, I've been lucky that way because, like I said, I'm, well, the Golden Gate Bridge doesn't take any skill. Uh, it takes a, a um, it takes a sense of adventure. And a teeny bit of stupidity, but not a lot, because it's actually technically very easy to do. And I'm not, please don't do it. You will get shot now, because when we did it it was in the 90s. After 2001, I'm sure somebody up there in the, you know, wearing black, creeping up along the cable to the tippy top of the Golden Gate Bridge will look like a terrorist and will be shot. So please don't do it. But it is simply a walk. It's very psychological. It's a cable that is wide enough to put one foot in front of the other. And as long as you keep your you know, mental acuity and keep your panic away, then you're fine. I mean, the only thing that could have hurt us was panic. And I like getting myself, I like putting myself in those situations because I love that mental sort of um, dance you do with yourself where uh, I feel like it makes me a better person. Mm. Um, and you, and, and so when I have people around me who are really brave and love adventure too, it's just inspiring. And and because like I told you before, I'm really not an expert at anything. I I love being outside and I love the opportunity to be outside. So because I, at a very early age, I sort of, you know, angled to be outside and started meeting people who led an outdoors life. So when I I was actually still in college, when I became a whitewater rafter and I was, you know, I was just like an average whitewater rafter. Um, But I met women and men, but I met a bunch of women who were really good and they were starting a team that did first descents around California and the world. And they needed somebody who was reliable (laughs) fairly fearless and strong. And I fit the bill. So I got to be on this team of amazing kayakers and whitewater rafters. And I really wasn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't have the experience they did at all, but I, as a result, we did first descents in California. And then we went to places like uh, Australia and Borneo and did first descent or attempted first descents there. And that's the kind of thing I just wouldn't have done if I hadn't cultivated friendships in this world. And at the time, I mean, it was, I was also lucky. And maybe, you know, this, like I, it's also a confluence of sort of luck too, because it was the eighties and it was the, at this um, confluence, it was at this moment where they were redesigning rafts. So suddenly rafts, which could never have done big rivers, big class five rivers, like the kayakers did were made um, to be self bailers. And suddenly every, if you took a big wave and it flooded your boat, you weren't suddenly out of control because the water would uh, flood out again. Mm. And I just happened to be a rafter at this time when this, these new rafts came in and allowed people to do first descents on rivers because there were many that hadn't been done because the technology wasn't good enough. So I got really lucky, you know, if I think if I had been, you know, uh, a little younger and it was the nineties and all the rivers would have been taken. (laughs) So interesting. Rafting is something we just started doing this year and we did it in Yosemite. It was so much fun. Um, I'd done it a little bit in Costa Rica and a little bit in the South when I went to school too, but I took my fiance and it was a blast. I highly recommend rafting, but I've never done an overnight raft trip. That sounds like the best. Sounds like you did that a lot. Yeah. 
Yes. I mean, but it was not, it was not like the overnight raft trip that I would recommend to you where you get someone else to cook for you. <laughs> I mean, we were, we would be in the jungles of Borneo, you know, Easy. waiting for the river to go down from flood level for, you know, a week of weeks, basically. Horrifying. And, um, I had one scary raft experience. But it was actually on a stand up paddleboard um, going down the Amazon river, but what? <laughs> yeah, it was super you sketchy. It Amazon? wasn't, it wasn't, it was just, I was just lucky. Like I got invited on this trip. A grandma could have done the paddle. It was easy. It was down river. It's just that no one had really paddled that stretch on a stand up paddle board. And so we right. were just part right. of this because crew. Stand up paddle boards are new. Yeah, it was new. Oh, and we big. just didn't know it was underneath us. And I think I gained like 10 pounds eating a jar of peanut butter pretzels because I was so scared the whole time. And I was hitting on the, the guide and he wasn't wearing a ring and didn't tell us he was married. <laughs> I was like, oh, so funny. River but, guys. um, yeah. But, you know, it was fun. It was it was scary. But, you know, when you're out there in nature, in the elements, it, there's no experience like it. Um, so what what's your outdoor adventure activity go to today? Like, what do you enjoy doing outside most? Um, well, I fly experimental planes right now. And <laughs> of course I have you do. for a long time, actually. You fly experimental that? planes? That's so badass. Like, what kind of planes? What does that mean? What's an experimental plane? That sounds so shady, by the way. I know, I know, I know. It sounds like, will it really fly? Does it fly? Um, a, experimental is a category slash class. I can't remember what the exact word is. It's the nomenclature for a certain type of airplane that, that can look like many different things. Mine happens to look the least like an airplane. It's basically a hang glider with a lawnmower or go-kart underneath it, which I sit in and... Like I, you know, and basically take off with, I have a four stroke motor, but you can have a lawnmower motor on, on them. It's a, it's basically a motorized hang glider. Interesting. Do you have a parachute uh, so I, in case anything goes wrong or? Well, things have gone wrong. Let me just tell you, uh, in my flying career, uh, but I've survived them all. Uh, but I do not have a parachute these days. No. I mean, parachutes are, I, I have flown with parachutes before. They're, they're a little bit just a psychological thing because most of the time you're going to really want to fly your, your, um, your plane to the ground. You're not going to want to just pull a chute and hope for the best. I mean, parachutes are for, for you know, disa- catastrophic mechanical failure. Got it. And hopefully I've checked my, my plane enough so it, it won't have that. Wow. Fascinating. You do so many cool adventures. I want to go back to writing because um, you wrote Gutsy Girl. Now now you're writing a book on tea. So you've <laughs> gone from firefighting. Um, you wrote a book called, is it, it has the word cat in it. Can you maybe tell me the name of that book again? Oh, Lost Cat, right? Yeah, it's called Lost Cat, A True Story of Love, Desperation, and GPS Technology. It sounds like a fantastic book. Um, you, your first book, Fighting Fire, now tea. Can you explain tea? Um, yeah, it, it, tea is a little bit of an outlier. To be honest, um, I'm one of my closest friends is a tea purveyor. He owns a company mm. called In Pursuit of Tea. And he's a tea purveyor. And I've actually been on some some tea hunts with him. We went to cool. Laos together years ago and to Bhutan looking for tea. And it's, it's actually maybe in another life, if I hadn't become a firefighter and then a writer, I would have been a tea hunter because Sebastian definitely doesn't sit behind a desk either. And basically we're doing a book together, just a primer on tea on, on, on what tea is. It's, um, but it was an excuse to work with one of my close friends. And it's kind of a, a way to sit back a little and, and, you know, most of my, not my, my books that have been about adventure are my first book, which was my memoir about being a firefighter. And then this one called the gutsy girl escapades for your life of epic adventure. Uh, but the other two weren't. And so tea maybe isn't such a big departure. I just love that you've managed to find adventure in tea. I had no idea that there was such a thing as tea hunters. Um, I think this is going to be an awesome read as well. Good for you. That sounds oh, no, it's, so well, fun. We don't, we're not going to, I know, I know it's fun. Like I get to, you know, excuses to go look for tea and pretend that's part of my research, which it's not. <laughs> so I also love that your last book you wrote with your partner. She's an artist, you know, writing and 
being an artist are two professions that are really usually hard to make a living at, but yet you guys join together and this book is a New York Times bestseller and it is a kick-ass book. So for those listening, we'll have links to it on the show notes. The Gutsy Girl is probably one of my favorite books. I read it in Yosemite after rafting. It was like the perfect companion book um, for that for that adventure. Can you just tell me a little bit about how you make a living as a writer and, and how you know your partner makes a living as an artist and how to how to make it happen? I'm not a, you know, I, I'm actually not a good role model for that either. I'm not a good role model. For yes, you are. You're, you're silly. No, no. Well, the, I, you know, as a firefighter, I have a stable pension. That's very unusual yeah. for jobs these days. So I don't make, I make money writing, but I don't rely on it by any means. Cool. Uh, Wendy, on the other hand, does actually Uh, make her money as an illustrator. And it's basically because she's kick-ass. She's really, really good and in high demand. Um, You know, I think that when I retired from the fire department, I didn't have any skills really. I had not been in the corporate world, so I didn't understand, didn't want to be for one, but also there's this whole corporate sort of etiquette that I would never would have, taken me a long time to learn. And, you know, I probably never would have broken into the corporate world if I had wanted to. So I really came out of the fire department only knowing two things. I mean, I knew how to write a sentence, a good, pretty okay sentence. And I knew how to do CPR. (laughs) And those weren't necessarily, and and by the way, I, I then plummeted into a terrible depression for almost two years. Mm. So, um, you know, when you leave a career, uh, it's just that you love for one. Yeah, I was injured. I had to get an, my knee replaced. So most people do 30 and I did, you know, 14. A lot uh, of people go through <laughs> depression when they have knee surgery or quit their job or just get done with something really big. I talked to a lot of adventurers and this is, this is pretty common. What did you do to kind of get out? Well, let's see. I didn't wash my hair. <laughs> I'd, I'd lost 20 pounds. <laughs> I I actually decided to be a writer. So I was already part of this community here in San Francisco called the San Francisco's Writers Grotto. And we are basically a bunch of writers who um, rent space together. We're not really a co-working space. We are more of a community because we share you know, a, a lunchroom and we share a kitchen and we share manuscripts and tips and advice and, and support. So we are, it's definitely, it was, is what saved me. I mean, it kept me sane right after those years after being a firefighter, because I had written one book, but when you write a one book, you don't feel like you're a writer. I was simply a firefighter who had written a book, getting a second book out, then you can feel like, oh, maybe I am a writer. And so uh, I wrote my second book, which was a novel, battling this depression and here at the grotto. And I was really lucky. I just had a lot of people who believed in me. So it sounds like it was all about the community that really helped you. Um, And that's so interesting because the writer's grotto, I actually have a friend, two friends there, and I always wished the writer's grotto was in San Diego. Just seems like such a cool place. You guys need to start one. We, we, um, we like uh, helping people start their own grottos and they have been, you know, starting. There's other writing communities that have been modeled on the grotto. So we're proud of that. That's awesome. Yeah, you know James. James I know James and a friend named Mike from from Emory Days, and there's a couple oh, other you know people. Mike yeah, He's amazing. Yeah, yeah. But we've also done a rafting trip. So funny, small world. So if you could go small back world. in time, and actually, I wanted to ask you one more question. You're a twin. Your twin happened to be on Baywatch. Are you guys friends with the Hoff? Yep. I mean, I got to ask that. Um, I, <laughs> no, um. I actually have never met him, but he's a super great guy. He seems like uh, according to my sister, cool who has high standards when it comes to people, because she's amazing. Uh, he's a re- he's really got he's a guy full of integrity. For those of you listening, Caroline's written she's written so many great things, and one of the funniest pieces is, is almost famous about having a twin sister who 
who is famous um, as an actress. Well, you're famous now too, but um, <laughs> <laughs> not really. Well, but, you know, she's she's recognizable. You know, so we we're identical, and so we look very much alike. I mean, we don't actually. If you saw us together, we you could probably tell us apart. But we're genetically identical, and Facebook can't tell us apart. Wow, how they're funny. they're always tagging her as me. <laughs> so that's how is how is being a twin you know, helped you in life. I don't know if you know this, but I have a friend who's also a twin and she's just the most successful overachiever I know. It's almost like she has this right, like, secret advantage. <laughs> it is. We do. We have, a, we have a secret advantage and a secret handshake and a secret club that we can't talk about. That's awesome. But uh, yeah, having, having a twin, especially an identical twin, it's, it's, it's tough too, you know? I mean, you're compared I imagine. and contrasted all the time yeah especially if you don't look exactly alike like we look enough alike where i would get mistaken for her all the time but um we look enough alike that we that people sort of like to think well maybe that i think they they do they look like oh if only she had that part of the other twin and that twin had this we could, they, like they could remake us into one whole you get that feeling a lot well that's super people. annoying this, but um Huh. Interesting. But it sounds like you guys had a lot but, of fun as kids and are equally passionate well, about what you do. Yeah. I mean, she's my biggest role model. I mean, she's, she's somebody who is, first of all, full of integrity, super reliable and believes in a lot of the same, I mean, the same values I do. I mean, she believes in bravery. She believes in honor uh, she she simply expresses it differently. I mean, she's an actress in Hollywood, and well, now she's a wellness coach because we're sort of she's you have to transition out of being an act. She's been an, a successful actress since she was eighteen, but we're now almost fifty four, so you can't. It's hard to be an actor at that age. You look really yeah, we're, young. We're, That's crazy. I never would have guessed <laughs> that. Um, and she looks great. She looks amazing. I mean, she's super fit and. At any rate, when you have somebody who's just who you admire so much that goes lockstep through your life, I mean, you you want to be as good a person as they are, and I think uh, she's really done that for me. If you could go back, and I don't know what you were like at fifteen, I'm guessing super adventurous, according to your book. But if you could go back and tell your fifteen year old self one thing, what would you let her know? The thing about being fifteen is, I think I was told everything that I would want to tell her and she just doesn't listen. I mean, she, <laughs> that's what being 15 is. There's one so thing, true. I mean, I would tell her some practice. I think if I gave some practical tips, you know, maybe she'd listen. She'd be like, okay. And one would be do yoga, like, do it. Okay. It looks stupid, but do it because I wish I had done yoga or stretched at least um, a lot earlier. I just was, I would never, never stretch. I know that sounds dumb, but I am the creaky injured person I am today because of things like that. So stretching, doing yoga, like deep squats, like where's this idea that you can't do a deep squat? I, some reason when I was a kid, deep squats were considered like bad for your knees. Yes, no. that's totally true. Wh what's your routine right now? Um, do you have any daily routines or your writing process? Do you have routines you stick to? Do you like get up at six and say, I'm going to write until 10 and then go for a run or how do you do it? What are your tactics? Well, I mean, I am for somebody who embraces adventure, which seems super spontaneous and it kind of is, maybe this is why I like adventure. I am really into routine and yeah. schedule. Like I, Wendy, it drives Wendy absolutely nuts, but my sister and I are the same way. Like we, we, Actually, what you should be asking us is, have you yet been a person who can break out of her routine? Because I like to, that's, that's what I'm proud of myself. Like, I know a lot of people want a routine and they think that's, I think it would help me if I sort of let go a little of my mm. routine. And I have, as I get older, I do. But for me, progress is when I can sort of be a little loosey goosey in my day, frankly. But uh, I do have a routine and it has helped me, you know, write books and and that is that I do get up early. I don't, I get up, I set my alarm for six. I read in the morning because it's very hard to read otherwise. You know, I read mm -hmm. fiction or creative nonfiction or maybe The New Yorker, but I, I try to set aside 
you know, a couple hours, which doesn't always work to read. And I, I eat the same thing in the morning and I have coffee, the same thing every day. What do you eat? If you don't, the same thing, what's the same thing? So freaking embarrassing. (laughs) It's two balance bars. That's great. And that's changed over the years. It's changed over the years, depending on like what, you know, what flavor has gone out of style. I think it used to be power bars or, but whatever. I, I, I feel I'm one of those people I need to start my day the same way. Mm. Something that feels like a foundation for me. And then I read and then I work out and then I go to the grotto and I write. Wow. That's and, interesting uh, that you read first. And reading is obviously so important for so many writers and it really is hard to fit it in. Um, so I think it's great that you do that first thing. Speaking yeah, of... Yeah, and it's really quiet. Yeah. And at night, if you tr- if I try to read, I just fall asleep right away. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, um, what books do you love or, or do you recommend? Well, I there was a there was a book that I used to give away a lot. Um and uh, it's called, it's by H.A. Ray. Do you know he wrote Curious George? Ah, oh, I loved Curious George. Uh, <laughs> well, he also wrote a book called The Stars, mm. which is basically, um, it's a book about constellations. And so it it retraces, you know how you've looked at, tried to learn constellations and you look at those old books and you're like, what? That doesn't look like, you know, Ursa Major the Bear. And that doesn't look like Leo the lion. Like, what the heck? I mean, I was always just just, flab- just flummoxed by these weird drawings in the sky. I love the sky. I love the stars. And I wanted to learn the constellations. And I found this book when I was a teenager. And it's called, it's by H.A. Ray, and it's called The Stars. And he redraws them simply so that it actually does look like a lion in the sky. And it actually, you know, does look like a scorpion. And it does look like a big bear. And uh, and so I give that book away because I think that we need to look at this. I, I'm concerned about a lot of things in this earth, but one of them is that we are losing sight of the sky. Mm. Now that sounds weird, but no, I think that's... if you lose... Yeah. Well, if we, I mean, if we lose sight of the stars, then we're going to we're gonna lose sight of our teeny little place in this huge universe. And then we're going to be full of much more hubris than we already are. So I, I give this book away on the stars so that people, friends and family can sort of look up in the sky. I also think it orients you, you know, when I, I used to travel quite a bit and just looking up at the sky and it was familiar, like I could see the constellations. They'd be in a, they'd be rising at different times and they'd be at different angles than maybe I was used to, but it's, it's sort of, um, it gave me a foundation. Mm, I love that. I mean, I have the iPad app, and it's really just probably not the same at all as a book. Oh, the, do you have Star Walk? I, it, whatever it is, you can like match your your phone to the sky, and it'll tell you exactly yeah. what's what's out there, which is helpful. But oh then you have I your cell it. phone with you, and I don't know. I I try to like when I'm in nature or in the woods or camping or usually somewhere where I can see stars that clearly. I try not to have my phone. So that book sounds like a fantastic gift to give someone. If you could fly your plane and it could have this giant banner behind it and give one message to the world, what would your message be? Oh, wow. Um, well, not to go all dark on you, but I think that um, climate change is our big thing. Like I want to ha- I want to say, oh, it's yeah. a silly inspirational message. No, that's okay. Probably <laughs> it's real. We can talk about it. It would probably say, dear everybody. It would probably be way too many words and teeny prints so I could get it all in. But it would basically say, you know, we don't have a lot of time. I think maybe we don't have time. Maybe it's over. I don't know. But as someone who's in the outdoors a lot, that is um, what really breaks my heart the most. Uh, because I think if we don't get our climate in order, we have nothing. Like all the other injustices really mean nothing. So I don't know. That's not a very, that's really unfun sky riding. Thing, <laughs> it's but. okay. It's really important. And this would be an eco-friendly plane, by the way, you were flying. So 
Caroline, oh, yeah, I would be. Yeah, would be I've, I love talking to you. I feel like I could talk to you forever. I think our next conversation should be over surfing because you're now a surfer. Um, and I bet you're pretty good. I, I am. I'm a bad surfer. No, no, You no, live no, in no. like San Francisco where surfing is hard and cold. Right. I'm, I know. I'm a really good paddler. That's, That's the thing is I really, I understand. I'm a good paddler. So I, so I go out in stuff that I can't surf, but it's cool because it's beautiful and it's huge and overwhelming and it elicits all these feelings that I like having. So you actually get outside at Ocean Beach. That's so impressive. Wow. Yeah. So I've been, <laughs> I sometimes look at the app and go, it doesn't look that big. It'll say like, 15. once it said 15 to 18 and I went, it doesn't look that big. It was triple overhead. And I thought, yeah, I think I'll just drive down there. And I really am not, I'm a really not a good surfer, but I am a good paddler. Wow. Uh, that's I also impressive. have sometimes questionable judgment is the problem. So, uh, but I, but I thought, oh, well, it doesn't really look like it, no one was out. So I thought I'll just get a, a workout. So I went paddle, paddle, paddle. And it was like, I was just hitting everything perfectly. And then I got outside and I was like, oh, <laughs> it is 15 to 18. Wow. It was a, it was, it was a, it was a lesson. Was did a lesson you, did you me. take any on the head or did they explode right in front of you? Which is like the worst absolute no. place to be. Oh no, no. The worst is to fall off the lip. Oh yes. No, true. That's the worst. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. All that, all that. Luckily I, I have a mindset of like, well, you know, I know how to swim. I know how to hold my breath a little bit. Um, everything will be okay. And it was. Awesome. So we can get your books, Fighting Fire, Lost Cat, A True Story of Love, Desperation, and GPS Technology, and The Gutsy Girl, Escapades for Your Life of Epic Adventure. I'll put all of that in the show notes. Where can everyone else, is there anywhere else we can find you? Can you share your website and maybe what, what you're working on next? Uh, well, my website is carolinepaul.com, and I'm on Twitter, but I, I'm not a big... Um, I, I think social media is great, but it just it doesn't come that easy to me. But I'm a Carol writer and my Facebook page is totally open too. So uh, people can find me there. Awesome. I'll have links to all of that and some of your great articles and books in the show notes. Thank you so much, Caroline, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're Next amazing. Next time in person, I hope. Oh, yeah, for sure. You're awesome. You are. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love your show, by the way. This show is, I've listened to every single, every single one so far, and you're, I think it, they're just great. Oh, you're awesome. Well, thank you so much, and um, thanks for listening, everyone listening in. Thank you so much for listening to this show. I hope you are motivated to go do something wild and adventurous right now. Caroline Paul is a total badass. She actually gave a TED Talk at the TED Women's event. It aired yesterday. She's going to be on the Tim Ferriss podcast show next week, or maybe when you listen to it, round two of her show on Tim Ferriss will have aired. You can go to Caroline Paul's website or just Google her. Get her books on Amazon. They're so good. I'll have links on where to get all of her great books in the show notes, wildideasworthliving.com. Just go to her episode and all the links will be in there. Thank you so much for listening and for subscribing. For those of you who enjoyed this show, I'd love it if you could just forward it to one friend. One friend, we're just trying to grow this podcast and get it to as many people as possible. Wherever you are in the world, remember the best adventures happen when you follow your wildest ideas. And don't forget, if you go to prana.com right now and enter the code wildideas at checkout, you'll get 20% off your order. We'll see you next week. 